Welcome to American Issues Take One on Think Tech Hawaii. I'm your host, Jay Fidel. Today, we're going to talk about the psychology of cult leadership. This is a subject of great complexity, but these days, great importance. Our guest for the show is Ken Burtness, and he's a psychologist and a social psychologist. So what are we going to talk about today? Well, you know, I was telling Ken that what comes to my mind is this whole notion of biochemistry and that uh, we are mammals, we are driven by biochemistry, we are driven to survive like all other mammals, we are driven to have um, food and water, uh, we are driven to be mm, social animals. And social animals implies relationships with others and that implies power. So, mm, you know, I, I woke up in the middle of the night thinking this is really all about biochemistry. But Ken, as a psychologist and a social psychologist, doesn't necessarily agree. Welcome to the show, Ken. I have been looking forward to uh, being on the show with you again. I've missed Think Tech Hawaii, and so I'm certainly happy to be here today. I think the main thing is interest to the audience, I would think, is that <clears throat> Jay and I agree <clears throat> with most everything except uh, the amount of factors involved and uh, you know, what is driving the train, as uh, as Jay would say. So, uh, but as far as what we're talking about, as far as what we're talking about power and uh, abuse of power and, uh, and those issues, uh, we're totally agreeing on that, that's for sure. Well, okay, let's look at cult. You know, um, demagogues, uh, I suppose, have always existed in the human condition, um, and cults have, probably, we I don't know, you know more about it than me, have existed in American history and European history uh, forever, I think. And so we need to know the psychology and social psychology of what makes a person a demagogue, a demagogue and what makes a, a, a person a charismatic leader uh, who doesn't feel responsible or care about other people, but wants them to love him and treat him as a cult. And then we want to know about what, what, what people think and how they uh, are magnetized by cult figures, why they follow cult figures. And this, I suppose, is an investigation of power, and power includes leadership. So let's talk about cults. Where do cults fit in the fabric of psychology and social psychology? Cults are a response to problems that we're having. And I think, so first before you, before a cult can spring forward, before a person can become a cult leader, there has to be certain factors that are working. Uh, for instance, you know, you talk about uh, power, you talk about uh, animals, uh, being an animal, and we certainly are animals, but we're more than animals. Uh, we take animals the next step, and that's what's always been, uh, great about us is that we're also interested in addition to individual power. We like having power, but we also like doing good. And so you've got those two sides. And uh, what I was telling Jay at the beginning of the, uh, you know, while we were getting ready to come on, uh, a lot of it's about heart. You know, you can have, uh, you can feel the strength of having power and being able to lead and all that and having people say, yes, sir, yes, sir, yes, ma'am. Uh, but if you're not helping people, if you're not doing the right thing, which I think is inbred in us uh, from the very beginning, it's going to cause a lot of problems. So I think before a cult leader can spring up, there needs to be certain factors that are negative factors in people's lives and frustration with people's lives and anger in people's lives uh, before they're ready to sort of turn things over to these people who have a lot of problems. I, th I think a key is, is what you said at the beginning, Jay, is that uh, we're human, we may be animals and all that sort of stuff, but to be human means that we have positive things and negative things going on within us. And for the negative things to outweigh the positive things, including getting your own you know, meet, needs met uh, at the expense of other people, that's a thing where one side is going is going well for you, your side, but the other side is saying to you, is whispering to you, this is not right. 
You know, this is not good. You know, you're going to feel better if you help people rather than if you don't help people and you hurt people. And a lot of taking power and a lot of cults wind up hurting people, hurting people extensively. And, you know, you can't just sort of ignore that and say, well, you know, it seems like some people can. It seems like some people can say, okay, you know, I don't care about these other people. I just care about me. Well, that's easy to say, but very hard to internalize. Because somewhere along the line, you're going you're gonna to start feeling that. And you're going to start realizing that, uh, you know, what's important in life? And are these people around me who are saying, yes, sir, yes, ma'am, all that sort of stuff, are they really, do they really like me? Because that's a real strong need of people. And if the answer comes back, no, they're with me because I've got power and I can make things a little easier for them, or they think I can make things a little easier for them. So uh, as a social psychologist, I'm looking at the pluses and minuses, and I'm concerned once those pluses uh, are outweighed by the negatives, uh, then we're in trouble. And then we're, you know, we're subject to people who can really ride rough, ride roughshod over people and hurt people. And I think a lot of people are being hurt today. And I think what we need to do is focus on how we can change people so that people are more, are happier with those pluses that they're getting, like helping other people, for instance. That's my old question. I always ask people this question when they use the word we. What do you mean we? You and me, I'm sure that you and me, we could fix it. But there's only two of us. <laughs> um, you know, if you want to fix um, what's going on with, uh, you know, Trump as a charismatic cult leader, um, you, need, um, you need more than half of 330 million people. And um, how do you reach them? How do you make them into a we? Well, for one thing, you know, you have them take a look at what kind of power they have. Uh, if Trump's got all the power or any charismatic leader has all the power, uh, they can pretty well call everything. And uh, they can tell you that they're going to do this for you. But if they got all the power, they don't have to do that. And I think that a lot of charismatic leaders uh, will promise one thing and deliver nothing or very little of what they promise you. Uh, and then the question is, how long are you going to put up with that? Well, it depends upon a lot of different factors. Um, one of the things that I'm really interested in is uh, what people value. And uh, whatever you value, you're going to come up with things that you agree with some people on what they value, what they value, and not agree with them on other things that they may value, but you don't, and vice versa. So uh, there's nobody, you know, no matter who you marry or who you run with or whatever that's gonna feel exactly like you, that's gonna agree with everything that you feel is important. Uh, and then you have to make a choice. You have to say to yourself, okay, what's, what's important here? You know, uh, I think nowadays what I'm finding, you know, looking at the relationships of people and everything, I'm finding that people are ignoring a, a rational way of dealing with that. If you're being rational, you look at somebody and say, okay, uh, I agree with him or her, 90% of the time, well, then, okay, that's, this should be no problem. But uh, if you agree with somebody 55% of the time and disagree with them 45% of the time, then it becomes a lot more difficult if you're going to support them, if you're going to support that person as a leader. Sounds like a poll. <laughs> yeah, exactly. You know, and that's why polls are so popular, because we want to know what other people uh, are thinking, especially nowadays, because we don't have much contact with other people. You know, first we ran into COVID and our contact with other people so we could talk to them and see what they believe in was really reduced. Uh, and then after COVID, uh, you know, we're coming back and we're coming back from COVID and we're starting to go back at work, but we're not going back to work. Uh, a lot of us are staying at home, working at home. So we don't see that people around the, uh, you know, you know, uh, the, the low sides of what's happening, you know, the, the uh, breaks. Uh, and we don't get to talk to them around the water fountain and things like that. Um, no, that was Abe Lincoln, you know, around the cracker barrel. After a while, I mean, I think there's a social psychology aspect to that. Imagine a room of people sharing views, and they have the, the they have they have the ability to get feedback um, yeah, and exactly. test their views on other people. 
I think, I think one thing, though, we ought to include in this conversation is the delta factor. If I, if I tell you a person is like this or a person is like that, um, that's, that's static. But as we know, mammals and animals and people change. They change through their lives. You, you can't know what a person is going to be like in a year or five or ten. Um, I guess you could make a trajectory, make some guesses. And you probably do that in your practice. But, but honestly, I mean, I have seen so many people change. And you're right, COVID has made them change all the faster. And our political environment these days makes them change. And they, and they tend to go to their bubbles. They tend to be drawn to the, the cult leader, some of them. Um, and so I, I wonder if you could talk about I guess it's the way it's presented in your in your practice, how people change, why they change. Uh, are they aware? Are they self-aware of the change? And shouldn't they be? Yeah, and I think, but there's always got to be the other side. You know, we look at somebody, you know, like a leader, a cult leader, for instance, and we see that they weren't they weren't that way five years ago or ten years ago, and we see that change in them. But we are also changing. And what we think is important is also changing. So they're changing and we're changing. That makes a, a double di di different mix. Um, so, you know, we have to take that into consideration. And not only people change, but like you say, uh, the things around people change, like COVID and like uh, staying home and doing part of your work from your home, both of which make it less likely that you're going to get other people's input. And I think a big thing that's happening here is where we get our input. If we're not getting it from friends and family and people we work with, where are we getting it from? Well, I think we're getting it from social media. And when we get it from social media, you know, what kind of social media are we listening to? Well, we make that choice. Now with friends, if, if I'm talking to you and we're talking and you're saying, well, I believe in this. And I say, well, I believe in something different. We can have a dialogue and I can hear you and you can hear me on social media. People aren't looking, at least a lot of people that I come in contact with, are not looking for to hear other people's sides. They want to hear their own side thrown back to them. They want to be with people who think exactly like they do. And they don't want to hear from people who don't think the same or don't believe the same, whether on a few, or few levels or on many levels. Uh, and so you get this really skewed type of you know, information, which is all about them you know, uh, saying, well, we believe in you, you know, so dial in to us. And so we dial in to them. Uh, that way, we don't have to worry about people who, who think differently than we do. And it's a lot comforting to a lot of people, I think, because they're on the internet all the time. You know, many people are. And what they're hearing is the same thing over and over again, the same thing that they believe in. And they don't have a chance to hear the other side of what's going on. They buy it. Yeah. And they concede power yeah. um, to the cult figure. What, what's the social psychology of seeing, I don't know, 50, 60 million people concede power to a cult figure who is somehow satisfying some need that they have, who is giving them the bubble of repeating what you know, they think they think, uh, and uh, depriving them of free will and free thought and bringing them in so that they follow this cult figure. Uh, and I'm thinking of Jim Jones in Guyana, uh, <laughs> you know, Jonestown, sure. um, even to the death. And, and Hitler, you know, and, yeah. and various other cult figures, charismatic figures who really didn't care about the human beings around them, who had no concern for life and liberty. They, they only wanted to have the power and the control. What makes people submit to that? You know, millions, tens of millions of people in this country have submitted to that when we know and they know that the, the, you know, that the, the cult figure is not putting out rational thought. It's operating, or he is operating on some other level. And nevertheless, ordinary people, you might even like them if you got into a room with them. If you got around a crack a barrel with them, maybe <laughs> um, ordinary people buy in. What makes them surrender their free will like that? Is that is that um, biochemical? What is that? No, I think, and I again, I think it 
goes back to what's happening with us now. <clears throat> and that is that I, we give up our, you know, our power to these people when we don't have the power in the first place. When we're living in a society where anytime that we tell people what we believe in, anytime we tell people what we hope will happen, what needs to happen, and sharing our views to other people. And then what happens, uh, like certainly recently, is that people just simply ignore you. You know, I go to some place where I think I'm getting a raw deal in, you know, whatever it is, and I try to complain to people, and they say, yeah, oh yeah, oh yeah, oh yeah, and nothing happens. We go to our congressmen, we go to our senators, we go to our, you know, the people that have the power, and they don't listen to us. You know, they just keep on going. And uh, that gets incredibly frustrating, you know, when you're not heard. Anytime you're not heard, that hurts a lot. And that's frustrating. And that makes you feel worthless. Uh, so somehow we need to get people's attention. Now, we may do it by, you know, going out on, and protesting. You know, we may do it at the university. We may do it at the, you know, at the ball game. You know, we could, you know, we could. If, but if people are not listening to us, if it has no effect, then we look for somebody who will have an effect, who promises us that they will be heard. I, I call this uh, your sort of surrogate, surrogate anger expressor, uh, mm. because that's what Trump does, for instance. He is angry all the time. You know, you look at him and he's, you look at his face and you know he's angry. And we like that because we're angry too and nobody's listening, but people listen to Trump and people listen to other uh cult leaders, because they got people's ears, and they seem to get things done, whether we like, well, whether what they get done, we like or not, at least they're getting some action. And it's been a long time, I think, since a, a lot of politicians have really listened to us. Politicians now, for instance, are good at spinning, you know, they'll spin something, and they'll tell you, oh, we'll do this, and we'll do that, and we promise this, but somehow that stuff never gets done. And I think a lot of people are really tired of it. There are a lot of people are really tired of not getting listened to. Now, you know, with Trump, Trump is, uh, he'll listen to anybody and he'll promise anything. And whether that happens, it's probably very unlikely, you know, but at least somebody's listening to us and somebody else, else is angry, like we are angry. And that's one of the great things about Trump as far as getting people to follow him is he's angry. I want to talk about, um, you know, the psychology and the social psychology of of um, lying and yeah. of people listening to lies when, you know, all of their faculties are telling them this is not true. Yeah. And yet they're out there by the tens of millions uh, accepting lies, lies at an extraordinary rate. It isn't only Trump, although I would say he is the king of lying. We've never seen anything like th that in the human condition where people can lie so regularly and so, and so blatantly and, and, and and then the the social psychology group actually accepts that. Uh, where does that fit in all this? Uh, don't they know he's lying? And why do they accept those lies? You know, again, I think it's a matter of choice. I think what happens is that uh, we want uh, that to happen. And if it doesn't happen, at least we got listened to. Um, you know, I hear this over and over and over again. People, you know, are saying, well, uh, Trump is going to do this, or somebody is going to do this, or uh, this governor is going to provide that. Uh, we're sitting in Hawaii, and how long have we had, uh, you know, that those, those things overhead, that things are supposed to be flying over, and all the money that we spent on uh, that? Uh, it's incredible, you know, and yet we keep sucking it up all the time, you know, we keep saying, and they keep saying, well, it's, you know, the rail is going to happen, it's going to happen, we're going to get this done. And how many years has it been and how much money have we spent and, and all that? And we still sort of accept it because if even if we don't accept it, what are we going to do about it? Can we go out there and build the rail system ourselves? I don't think so. You're opening so many questions. Uh, you know, what, yeah. about, what about memory? <clears throat> you know, I mean, if somebody lies to you um, and you accept it at least for the moment in the hopes that it will come true somehow, and that you can pass it over as a lie. It's okay. It's all right. Uh, and then, you know, you forget because people forget. And I would say groups of tens of millions of people forget too. 
And the guy who gave the lie then turns his back and he lies about what he said. It's the lie about the lie. You know, um, for example, uh, recently uh, Trump said that uh, he never said that the military were suckers and losers. <laughs> when in fact, we know he said that. We, we have it on tape. And people accept that. There are people by the tens of millions who accept the lie about the lie because they forgot what he said. And even if you remind them, they still forgot what they said. What about the human condition of forgetfulness? Forgetfulness is one thing, but uh, rationalizing your particular stand is another thing. Uh, you know, if we're looking there and say, uh, let's, let's take uh, the uh, women and men, for example. Now, say you're a woman and you live in Texas or uh, Arizona or New Mexico, uh, and you're really concerned about uh, people coming in, illegal aliens coming in. And uh, so you're going to back uh, the person who is really supportive of a really strong thing of keeping everybody out you know, and doing all these things to make sure that these illegal aliens, uh, you know, don't get in. Uh, and, you know, it's it's always incredible to me how we can forget that we're all aliens. None of us are, you know, have been here since the beginning. <clears throat> you know, my parents came over from uh, uh, Norway in uh, the early 1900s and the late 1800s. Uh, you know, so I'm an alien, you know. I'm a person who came over here, and by the grace of God, uh, I was accepted, uh, mostly because uh, we decided that we didn't want to go back to Norway, and everybody wanted to be an American really quickly, and uh, so we did that. Uh, but, you know, uh, my great-grandparents came over, so I'm very, you know, recent. I don't, I don't go back to the, uh, you know, way back to the 1700s and 1600s and all that, and it seems just very strange for me to, you know, to support the idea of we're just going to keep everybody out. You know, we're not going to let anybody come in. We're not going to let them take our jobs. We're not going to do all this and all that. Uh, that just seems so incredibly un-American uh, to me. Uh, and yet we sort of suck that up. And if you're a woman and live in those states, uh, and that's important to you, um, then you tend to, then you can easily forget about all the negative things that Trump has said about women. You know, which I find amazing. You know, uh, if, if if you're raising daughters, like I'm raising my daughter, and uh, well, she's now raising me because I'm old. But uh, <laughs> but you know, uh, she was the most important person in my life. You know, and to have somebody denigrate her, you know, just uh, blows me away. You know, and I just get so angry about that. Uh, but the you know, but people the parents of, uh, of women and women themselves, uh, if something else is more important to them or important to them at that particular time, like, you know, uh, uh, granting people to come into the country, then they forget about those things. And uh, you can only forget so long uh, and things sort of creep back in your mind and, you know, and that irrationality that's born of that uh, starts whispering to you, you know, this guy was terrible to you, you know? I hope yeah. so. But, you know, in the case of Hitler, um, scapegoatism, uh, and, and we have elements of that now in the, in the right-wing movement in Europe against migrants, you yeah. know, mm -hmm. um, where migrants uh, threaten them, uh, threaten changes they don't want to see, threaten uh, that they would lose power, be replaced. <clears throat> the Charlottesville slogan, be replaced. Yeah. And, um, you know, as, as a result, which, you know, you have this kind of uh, social priority. It's like um, it's like the caste system. If you came recently, you're lower on the on the totem pole. Sure. Yeah, absolutely. <clears throat> and, and we and we have to scapegoat you and uh, and people will join us to scapegoat you. And, and that is a big priority for people. And so they are attracted to the, you know, the autocrat who is selling scapegoatism and uh, let's let's um, undermine any rights of the uh, of the migrants. Um, then, of course, you have you have other issues. And I don't understand this. So in this country, that may not be the biggest issue for a given individual. If you go into Marlboro country, the guy loves guns. 
And that's really important. So on the one hand, you're attracting misogynists and you're attracting anti-immigrants. And on the other hand, you're, you're, tra you're attracting gun, the gun person. <clears throat> and each one of those puts a priority on that issue. But they all jump on the bandwagon for Trump. So I, what I'm saying, and I really would like your thoughts about this, is that he is attracting people for one issue, even if they don't agree on the other issues, but they come along on the one because that troubles them, uh, and they and they make the compromise on the others, uh, and that's it's brilliant autocracy, brilliant uh, demagoguery is what it is, and ultimately you get all these people supporting you, even though they don't really agree um, on the primary issue, you know that you're selling. I, I find that extraordinary, and I find it happening, and I've, it has happened. It has happened, and it is what we have here in this country. It's a prioritization. It's a social, it's, it's a social caste system, but it's, it's in many different silos. Yeah, and I think that's, that's the key, uh, is that Trump will go any which way. You know, he'll go one way today, Next day, he'll go the other way today. And we avoid thinking, well, gee, that's crazy. You can't be do everything at once. You can't be everything to everybody at once. Well, that's what Trump does best, is he applies to everything, because he doesn't have to attend to, and, and, and this is true of uh, you know, all people who are, you know, uh, you know, as you put it, you know, the people who are out there who are you know, you know, t calling the shots in life for us. Uh, is that they'll tell you anything. And uh, and once you hear the magic word, then you ignore the rest of it. But you can only ignore so long before it, it, it comes back to you. You know, and the thing that I do when I, you know, and I'm faced with this with, uh, with people who are winding up doing things that later on they're really going to feel bad about, uh, you know, not behaving in the way that they, according to their heart, but they're behaving in a way according to what I need and uh, what I want, et cetera, et cetera. Very, you know, um, what I'd have them do is look at uh, their families. Uh, Cause I taught uh, family uh, therapy for a long, long time. And uh, one of the things that really gets people is if you make it a family issue, uh, for instance, um, you know, we're, uh, we're going along with the uh, uh, tobacco lobby. And the tobacco lobby said, the tobaccos are fine, you know, vaping is fine, this is fine, you know, all these things are fine, because we're making money off of it, and we'll guarantee it, you know, we'll guarantee that this is a good way to go, and it's actually very detrimental to your health. Well, people, you can feed that to people, and people will immediately see that that's BS, and they'll see by looking at the science, for instance, that, in fact, this is very dangerous to your health, and this is going to shorten your life, and they can see that, and they still will go ahead and smoke and smoke and smoke, you know, or vape and, you know, or do whatever, but use that tobacco that is very deadly for your health. The difference is when I work with them on anti-substance abuse and say I'm working with them on trying to help them get, uh, you know, away from tobacco, for instance, uh, I'll say to them, okay, you know, that's your choice. If you decide to give up five, 10 years, 15 years of your life to tobacco because you really like tobacco, that's your choice. Now, however, when that impinges upon your family, for instance, when that secondhand smoke that you're doing makes it bad for your kids to breathe in that secondhand smoke and they get the negative you know, happenings to their health because you're smoking, you know, isn't it about time you quit? And that's the one factor that helps people get rid of tobacco and change their ways and their way of thinking more than any other factor that we give them, whatever you know, medication we give them, whatever therapy we give them as far as what they're supposed to do, you know, behavioral type of stuff and all that sort of stuff, uh, even self-examination, they're willing to, ex to let everything go so they can continue smoking, except when it hit hits their kids. If you get to the point where you say to uh, yourself, uh, okay, uh, am I going to let this happen? And am I going to let this visit my kid? Am I going to let this, this do this to my kid? And that's what 
you know, we really have to draw, you know, that's where we're most able to draw the line on that, mm -hmm. when it really impinges the people that we love and care about. And the more we focus on the people we love and care about and doing good things for them, the less susceptible to demigods that, that, that we are. And uh, which the, the demigods are facing, are giving us what we want, a very selfish type of view. Whereas if you move that away to the family, it's a giving type of thing. It's a helping type of thing. And that's what's gonna beat the demigods and all that. If this reflects a, a decline of the institution of family, doesn't it? Um, you know, these, these kids, these people spend all their time on social media. They, uh, for COVID and other reasons, they're really not engaging around the cracker barrel. There's nobody at their elbow saying, you know, you can't do that. If you do that, um, you're gonna hurt yourself and your children and so forth. So that the family institution has been affected and its decline uh, allows, you know, cult figures to emerge, Trump to emerge. I just I want to ask you one other big question before we go, Ken, and that is this. You know, um, we live in a democracy. A democracy is essentially a very sophisticated social order. It's a it's a bunch of moral principles that everybody, at least at one point in time, agreed to. We had a national agreement on, on, on the priorities. And now it doesn't seem that we do. We don't respect that agreement. Uh, we don't respect the, the moral principles involved. We don't respect the, you know, the, the priorities anymore. Um, and this is very troublesome. Can you, can you talk about the connection um, between social psychology and democracy, or if not democracy, then peaceful coexistence uh, with the other people in your constituency? Well, you're a lot more optimistic than I am because uh, I think it's been a long time since we've had, you know, I don't think we've ever had a true democracy. Uh, and it's been a long time since we even had a partial democracy. Uh, I think our country is all about uh, money is all about uh, making money. And to make money, uh, you have to, you know, that's where our focus is. If you've got a question between, you know, uh, say for instance, you're an airline company and do you do the right thing and uh, make sure that everything is safe when you fly and that all the, uh, everything is taken care of and looked at and has the best that, um, you know, that we can offer as far as your safety goes. Or do we want to make sure that we're making a lot of money for our shareholders? And, uh, and it would help us if we cut a few corners. It would help us if we have less people working for us. Uh, this is what's really happening in so many parts of our country is that, uh, you know, that's where we're at is making money. That's what we do uh, in this society. And, uh, you know, and we're to, to sort of, you know, highlight that uh, the rich are getting richer and the poor are getting poorer and people are getting angry because, uh, you know, if I look at what I made when I was young and what I could get for that I made, and if I was starting out again today, I would not be able to get anywhere as close what I got, uh, you know, with the stuff. I, I may be making a lot of, quote, more money, you know, because my daughter makes a ton of money more than I do, but what can she buy with it? Um, and today what we can buy is very little. And so the money may look like it's a lot, but, uh, you know, what we get out of it is something else because everybody's saving money. Everybody that's selling to us is going the way, uh, our mom and pop stores are disappearing like crazy. You know, people who are, you know, making stuff for people that, you know, I used to go to grocery stores, the mom and pop grocery stores go on in and, uh, say hi to everybody. They knew my family. You know, I come in and buy stuff for my kids, my dad, you know, things like that. We all knew each other. We all liked everybody and everybody was trying to do the best for people. Nowadays, you go to a place to buy something, whether it's at a grocery store or, you know, a, or a place that sells cars or whatever, you know, you're not going to know these people. And, uh, and their interest is not that you have a nice car to drive or that you have the best uh, washing machine that will take care of you. Uh, they're interested in their you know, they're, they're making money because your boss is making money, then they'll have a job to go to, et cetera, et cetera. And that's where this country is. And it's getting more and more like that. And that's what really concerns me. 
And that's where a lot of the anger comes from. You know, I can't get what I should be able to get. I'm working hard. And not only am I working hard, but my spouse is working hard. When I grew up, there was only one of the two that are working. Part of that is invidious comparison, yeah. <clears throat> where you have your television in your living room, which you spend yeah. plenty of time. Uh, and you had those ads coming on social media and you get the feeling that everybody around you has all the consumer goods they ever wanted, yeah. driving fancy cars and buying big houses and everything you ever wanted. And you don't have that. And that makes you, you know, invidious and angry. Anyway, I think we're almost out of time. I just want to add this, Ken. I, I, you know, um, you say we, I say we, we all say we, but I think the we really refers to um, having the cracker barrel, having the family, having somebody like you that could point out, you know, these truths and these mm, personal revelations that we ought to be thinking about. And that's why I suggest that the country would be better off if we had 50 million clinical psychologists <laughs> and that everybody, everybody had the benefit of a conversation with you, including Donald Trump. He needs it more than most. Off of what you're saying is make life simpler, you know, because that's where the true happiness is. You know, it's not in how much you own, how much is out in your garage or in your, you know, your attic or things like that. It's it's spending time with people you care about and doing the simple things in life, especially here in Hawaii, where you can go out and I can go out on my lanai. You know, I can go out to my park and be with my friends there and not spend any money, but sit there and enjoy this beautiful place that we live in. And the more we do that, the less we need all that other stuff that everybody's trying to sell us and make money off of us from. Make life simple. Enjoy your time with the people that you care about, your friends and your family. That is what I would like to leave people with. Caring. It's all about caring. Absolutely. Ken Burton is psychologist and social psychologist joining us here on Think Tech. Thank you so much, Ken. Thank you for having me, Jay.